our text then this morning by the Holy Spirit from this section of the letter to the believers, Hebrew believers, believers who were more than casually aware of the things that had been made known to the prophets in the past. They had lived by those things. It was the way of life that was handed down to them from their forefathers. But remember, Peter said it was futile. Futile. Futile, yeah. Futile sacrifices. Futile. Empty. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not able to accomplish what was needed. Amen. Now in this text that we'll give our attention to this morning, obviously the writer is making a summation. Uh, When he wrote this, there were no chapters, verses. His thoughts were flowing full and abundantly. (laughs) He had uh, turned their minds back and quoted text after text after text after text. In fact, this section that we call chapter 10 has seven, if I remember, six or seven different quotations. It's the largest section that we have separated section that we call a chapter. Uh, It it has more quotations in it than any other section of this letter. Uh, In fact, the the, uh, letter we call Hebrews uh, is the second, has the second largest number of quotations in the New Testament, or in all of the letters, I should say, in all the letters. Romans has more. Romans has 50-some. Hebrews has 30-some. Between 30 and 35, Romans has uh, 51, I think it is. And the writer here is, is he's, he's summing up the obvious implications of what he's been saying really from chapter 5, what we call chapter 5, where he began talking about the high priesthood, the superior priesthood of Jesus, his superior position, because, of course, his superior life, his life, not the life of another. And that's, that's the point that's emphasized here and in several other places in the letter. Just earlier, just a few paragraphs earlier, he emphasizes this, his life. Of course, he uses the word blood. But these readers knew that the life was in the blood, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, from the Levitical record, from the exposition and elaboration of the things that were made known on the stone tablets. Now this writer comes to this point, having alluded to the law, several times and mentioning it specifically it was ordained by angels said there in chapter 7 he goes back to it again here for the law for the law which declared God's name in righteousness truth, goodness and power but its revelation was incomplete now the Jewish the, uh, the Jewish believers would not have accepted that. In, in fact, you remember their reactions to some of Jesus' teaching where they saw the implications of what he was saying. That what he was saying and doing would eventually lead to an eclipsing, not a, not a removal of the law, but an eclipsing of it. What he would say and do would supersede it and it would be it of course was incorporated into what he would do and the apostle Paul expounds on this in Galatians chapter 3 where he says the law was added or as the savior was keeping these promises and these promises of course are the primary foundational cornerstone of what God was doing in the earth, of this revelation of himself, his eternal purpose, his everlasting intent that he is working, that he is constantly working at. It has not changed. You see, the Jewish people, 
Israel made the same human error that our current generation is making. They had made themselves the center of everything that God was doing and saying. And that's what our current generation is doing. This with, with phrases like personal savior, personal salvation. To the point where the church is just an addendum for, for my fulfillment, my happiness, my continuation of my dreams, my hopes, my aspirations, however you want to say it. Well, the Jewish people have done the same thing. You remember in the argument, the scribes, Pharisees, priests had among themselves if we let him go on like this, the Romans will come and take away both our place, our place that's right. and our nation. See, the nation was just an addendum to their place. That's right. The nation was to support their place. Yeah. They were the ones who had the authority and the rights in the temple area, weren't they? And boy, if they wanted to turn it into a marketplace, they could do it. And no one could challenge them. Who gave you the authority to do these things, they said to him. And of course, when the Galilean appealed to his personal knowledge of the father, my father's house, well, that was a ground for execution. Execute. See, they were not going to let the heir come in and take their property. What they saw was their property. This is the heir. Let's kill him and take his property. Yes, that's right, man. See? It's an amazing thing, isn't it, that they knew he had spoken these parables against them. But they were so enslaved, they could not shake free. Amen. They could not do it. How could it be any other way but that God would but that God was affirming their place. Their place. They were upholding the traditions of the fathers. This man had no respect or regard for the fathers. And they were the guardians. They were the guardians of those things, weren't they? <clears throat> so when Jesus or Stephen or Paul said words that led them to the logical conclusion that what they were saying and doing was not the be all, end all, do all. Mm -hmm. Let's kill them. Uh -huh. that's right. And that's what they did to the master and to our brother. And they attempted many times to execute Paul and only, of course, by God's uh, provision and protection did he escape. So that he could continue his work, brother. They fulfill that the delusion that Satan foisted off on Eve. Mm -hmm. He is God knowing good and evil. Yes. See, he brought it to 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 people like this who thought they had the knowledge to be Yes. Right yes. Now. Yeah. Where did this man get this learning? <laughs> Having never been taught. We've been taught. We have the credentials. Both uh the intellectual credentials, the uh, uh, family background credentials, their place, their place in the city, their, you name it, however you want to describe it. <laughs> they had everything. It was their vineyard. Yeah. They'd done the work. They'd been there overseeing it. How this man come in here and think he can take over. See? Now this is this is the background mm -hmm. thinking of the opponents of the master, our Savior, as he went about his ministry. And it was also the thinking and background of those who opposed 
one of their own number, my goodness, who converted to this man and then began a vigorous, aggressive, and effective, Amen. effective exposition of the things that this man began to do and teach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. They knew, they knew even though, even though this man Paul had not been with Jesus, like Peter and John, mm -hmm. they knew they'd been with Jesus, huh? Yeah. We cannot stop speaking what we've seen and heard, they said. But it was one of their own number who really extended these things that Jesus began to do and teach in a, in a, in a, in a totally unexpected manner in his preaching and teaching and then in his letters. Now, we don't know where these readers lived. They, they might have been the same group that Peter wrote to. Scattered out all over. It may, it may have been a, a letter that was intended to be carried from mm -hmm. congregation to congregation to congregation, wherever. Mm -hmm. People who were, of course, cast out of the synagogues. Not welcome there anymore. You remember, yeah. wasn't it Sosthenes that was yeah. beaten in the street in Corinth? Because it's likely that he, at least, he was sympathetic and welcomed them even after realizing what they were teaching there in Corinth. And so they just beat the man right there in the street in front of the Roman court. And of course the Roman court said, we have nothing to do with this. This is your own matter. Quit wasting my time. Bailiff, remove them from the court. <laughs> and they did and they went outside and had a small mob action in the street vigilante action against their own leaders who uh, and, and again we don't know the details but it's likely that the man was at least pretty sympathetic if not uh, completely in agreement with the things that Paul and Silas and Timothy were teaching Jesus, brother yes that's true, isn't it? In the church, someone from within. Yeah. 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 Luther. Wycliffe. Tyndall. Calvin. Go right down the list. All of these men came from within and made some attempt to influence the institution, but of course they weren't able to. They were not able to. Yeah. He went to the synagogues everywhere in, in, in Antioch of Pisidia. He went to the synagogues, taught there. And they were the ones that followed him to Iconium and Lystra and stoned him in Lystra. It was the Jews from the synagogue in Antioch. From the higher, higher vantage point, you can see that this proved that people enslaved the tradition like this. Yes. 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 Yeah. But they did, and yeah. That confirmed and his his biting words confirmed. See, I mean, he just flung it right in their faces, N not kindly. Yeah. Some would say, "Well, didn't Paul say something about being kind to people?" And not argumentative, didn't he say that? Well, in most cases, yes. Unless, of course, you know your audience. And you just want to seal the truth. And that's what the Holy Spirit did through Stephen. Amen. Religious enslavement is a special kind of It certainly is. Yeah. And we still deal with a lot of it today. Our brethren in Pakistan are dealing with religious enslavement. Their enemies are enslaved to a religion. That will not let them go without uh, some kind of wrenching, <laughs> some kind of wrenching experience. Like Paul's wouldn't have let him go. They were the silversmiths in Ephesus. That was a heathen, but he was a religious yes. uh, opposition. Yeah. And, and tied up with their economic well being, right. <laughs> their personal status, 
and so forth, tied up with that, then that sealed it. You know, first it was their religion, then it was their pocketbook, <laughs> and their families, and their social status. I mean, the, the, the ones who made those, those silver uh, idols probably had quite a status in the community. Huh? Highly regarded artisans, religious artisans. Yeah. Was there ministry? Ministry of arts, huh? Yeah, brother. Uh, uh, there in John 9, remember when Jesus healed that uh, man at the pool of Siloam that was blind from his birth? And God actually gave this man boldness and spoke through this young man yes. to the Pharisees. And I just want to give you some of the reason because as they interrogated him, he said, What, do you want to be one of his disciples? Yes. And uh, here's where the record picks it up. <laughs> they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, We're here it as a marvelous thing. Yes. You know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Yeah. Now we know Dripping that God sarcasm. Are not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he hear it. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. You yeah. almost hear the climax yes. of what he was saying there. And then, of course, they reviled him. Yes. That was a sinner. Threw him out. Do you teach us? Yeah. So, yeah. Yep, there it is, a confirmation. Yes. Of the well, now, brother, we, we, we want to make the point that, you know, the, these words of, of this healed blind man... The, uh, their boldness <coughs> and their very sharp uh, incision and penetration of these men's thinking was not just to win an argument. It was not just to be impressive. Well, man, he let those guys have it, didn't he? <laughs> no, not at all. We're talking about the truth here. We're talking about, there, hey, there are those who glory in their debating skills, just to just to zing the other guy, you know, and that's that's not what we're talking about here, brother Tony and sister June. Actually, the sharp uh, rebuttal is actually a defense mechanism, like you said. That one. Certainly, this, yes. This is the way that you defend yourself. Yes. Against any kind of intrusion or any attempt to deceive or to slay or to yes uh, to, uh, go against the truth. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what I'm saying is you have to be this one. Yeah. Well, Paul, in, there in Galatians, about this circumstance with Titus, said we, we, were not, we did not submit to them for one moment. Yeah, yeah not one moment. Sister June. Yeah, Peter also wrote that uh, we, have a, we have a belief, and we're not speaking cleverly the lies. Yes. Yes. They're willing to say this is the truth. Yes. They, they'll say, I, I think this is mm -hmm. the truth. Yes. Or I'm, I, I believe that this is the most accurate way to view this. Yes. Or it's very modified. It yes. Isn't, it doesn't have that strength that a person needs in yes. order to live before God in a good conscience mm -hmm. and, and in assurance of faith. Yeah. See, it's a robber. Even in the days of the Jews, you know, I'm sure that there were there were people who were uh, they they wanted to know. You know the Pilate Pilate said what is true, you know, but there were people whose hearts were were really searching that out. What is truth? These are God's people. Mm -hmm. These are saying this. Here we have we have this man whose life is completely righteous. No one can find fault with him. He speaks the word of God. It, it created a, a great conflict, yes. a schism, if you will. Yes, exactly. Because the leaders did not, they didn't understand the truth, and, and some of them held the truth in unrighteousness. Yes. So we've got to be able to go back. God has traced it through history from the beginning. He's done this. He has left a record. Mm -hmm. So when someone wants to walk another religion against the, the faith of Christ Jesus, 
as it's written in the prophets, in the law, and in the epistles, uh, that we have a consistent and uh, an unassailable. There are people who try to, but they have to lie to do it. They have to rest the record. Mm -hmm. There is too much that people want us to use the term. God has documented it for us. He's made proof of his word to us because he knew the struggles that men would have to be able to apprehend that which cannot be perceived by the senses. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's helped, I love that statement, Brother Tim um, Crawford made it sometime back in uh, one of the renewals. He says, he helped our unbelief. Mm -hmm. The man who yeah. cried out, I believe, Lord, help thou my family. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a whole generation crying that. And so, it, it, just as Paul, it's not wisdom of man or technique. It is, it is going back and being faithful to the record yeah. that God has given of himself. And that's, that's the strength of Paul's arguments. Mm -hmm. They're not arguments as in uh, vain debates. Like yes, you were for the sake about, of debate. But they are. They are arguments for the truth. Yes. And if a person will just step aside and say, let God be true, but every man a liar, he can know the truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Now that, that life, something very real happened to him. Look at what he knew. He knew, first of all, he knew that there had never been a man born blind that had been healed. Yes. Well, see, there's a lot of Christian people going to that. Yeah. He knew that, and his reasoning it was impeccably strong. So he, but it, because something real had happened to him. Yes, him. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, he, so if something real happens to you from God, you're transformed. This there you go. The edge, you yeah. We you cannot help but speak what we have seen and heard. Amen. We're not going to stop. Yeah. You judge whether we ought to obey God. Yes, man. yeah. What a question. Brother. Yes. The expressed image of God now it becomes inexcusable. Yes, that's right. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Of what Jesus has said when he Amen. Amen. To whom much is given shall much be required. Amen. So, well, brother, we must hurry along. We only have an hour here. We've just we've just gotten past the beginning here. We said those things to, to lay the ground. Uh to prepare the ground for our thinking about, about these, the recipients of this letter. It's likely that wherever they were, they didn't necessarily have to be in Judea, but wherever they were, they were dealing with this mentality. The unbelieving synagogue leaders will say, this covenant God made with Israel is eternal. And you come in here saying that this Nazarene has changed things? You know, that would be the, that would be the, the uh, uh, first reaction of unbelief. Changing the eternal word of God? Yeah. Well, there's no question what that is. And it must be removed. Hmm. See? They couldn't distinguish between the old covenant and the covenant that God made with Abraham. No. They couldn't distinguish. They did not see that point. See, there, there are hints of it, obviously. Yeah. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. I'll make a new covenant. <laughs> Eternal word of God, huh? It, it's kind of like in the beginning, God created light. But then he created the sun, moon, and stars and gave them focus. There you go, and, yeah. And so it's, in, the, in the law of the prophets, there's light. Mm -hmm. But it, yes. it wasn't brought into focus for mm -hmm. us. But when the sun came. Yes. Yeah. The true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. That's right. That's right. See? Amen. More than the sun, mm -hmm. which in some sense is a source. The stars as well, but they're too far away. The moon is no light source at all. It's simply a reflection. Isn't it? That's right. Simply a reflection where... Uh, in, in the case, for instance, right now, if you noticed, I don't, didn't notice the moon last night. It, 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 
I think this week it's had just a little bit of light and mostly shadow. So you've got a mixture of light and shadow on the same surface. And we've got this in the revelation of God down through the generations. A little more light, a little more light, a little more light. Mm -hmm. Shadows there as well. Mm -hmm. Now they're not mixed. They're clearly delineated. See? You can see that 16th yeah. and yeah. one eighth and so forth as, it, as the light comes around. They're, so they're not mixed. We're not talking about an eclipse here. But we are, aren't we? <laughs> We're talking about one who eclipses. That's right. Doesn't remove it because it's still there. That light's still there. The law and the prophets testify of these things, Paul wrote, didn't he? That's right. There in Romans 3.21. They testify of these things. There's an underlying message in both the law and the prophets. Yes. But it wasn't again by human strength, but you couldn't believe. No. You had to be willing to, what was Paul's words there in Romans? Submit yourself to the righteousness of God. But if you were not willing to do that, if you thought that you could observe these commandments and establish your own righteousness, right. then you would not submit to the righteousness of God because I've got it right here and here's the proof from the word of God. See? Right. So don't tell me. Doing yeah. yeah. And I'm doing. <laughs> At one point, Paul would have said, I'm doing. Yeah. But don't you tell me uh -huh. that somebody's going to come in here and change the word of God. Well, I'll fight you to the death. And that's exactly what he did. Of course, it was their death, not his. <laughs> because here on the earth, he's the one that had the power, wasn't he? He had the authority. He had the letters from Jerusalem, didn't he? Yeah. To the synagogue of Damascus. And we're going to go get some more. I'll see you when I get back. But Saul didn't come back, did he? No. Somebody named Paul did. Amen. He kind of looked like him. <laughs> But they really weren't sure at first because he had a different appearance to him. And he didn't think like Paul, Saul did anymore. He said strange things. Where did he get this learning? To come back in here to Jerusalem and say these things about the man we sent him to destroy his memory. And he comes back here and makes it bigger and stronger. So see, this, this is the... This is the foundational thinking that these, that the first readers of this letter, the recipients of this letter had to deal with as they perhaps, and we don't know, but perhaps their own family members accusing them of forsaking God's truth. Yeah. And now they have no priest. They have no holy place. They have no sacrifices. They've forsaken the only thing that God has given us whereby we may approach him. Can you see that, that reasoning to them? So what are they going to do? They're going to stand before God with no hope. That's pretty religious sounding, isn't it? That's a pretty strong religious argument about how are you going to meet God. The prophet said, prepare to meet your God. And all, all of those words could be marshaled against these believers yeah. in the Nazarene. Yeah. In this Galilean who came and attempted to take control of the temple. Two times he attempted to do that, but we fought him off, didn't we? We showed him what for. And these people are trying to raise him from the dead. Trying to bring that man's blood on us. Stole his blood. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we've got the evidence of witnesses, don't we? They've got their chosen witnesses. Well, we've got our chosen witnesses. Bring those soldiers in here. Of course, they probably hightailed that out of town as fast as they could. Or they were conveniently removed by military transfer. Maybe conveniently removed by a sword, huh? Or a knife. The prophet said... My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
Now, that, that eclipses a lot of things in the book of Leviticus and Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not that they're not true. Because the, e, e, even those thoughts were beyond their thoughts, weren't they? At the beginning they were. Yeah. Boy, the eye had not seen and ear had not heard what had been revealed to Moses on Sinai. I had it. No, no Jewish intellectual developed these things that Moses brought down from the mountain. Right. It was not like the things that they'd seen in Egypt. Yeah. Not at all. It was not like the things that they would see in the camps of Moab at Peor. They were not like the things that they would see among the Philistines when they went into Canaan. They, their law was not like those things, was it? The imaginations of men, the vain imaginations of men. The things that God had delivered to them was not like that at all. God said, these things never entered my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Just and holy law. Yes. Yeah. So on one level, even the law of Moses is like that. Right. Of course, it's a pretty low level because the things that Moses delivered to them were all earthly things. They were all things that they could put their hand to. Well, the high priest put his finger in the blood and sprinkled it before the ark. His hand was in it. The blood was put on Aaron's ear and thumb and toe. They, they touched these. They ate the sacrifices, didn't they? Remember, remember Moses' reaction after the death of Nadab and Abihu? Why didn't you eat the sacrifice like God commanded? See, the sacrifice was, they were to eat it. The, in, in some of the sacrifices, they were to eat, the offer was to eat the sacrifice. They were to give some of it to the priest. They were to eat it themselves. So they were physically involved in this as, as intimately as you can in the flesh. That meat became part of them. Just like our food does us. Brother. Yes. Here you have you have something that God would have received, so why should yeah. the priests receive? Yes. And and Aaron, even in his grief and trouble at that time, saw a greater truth yeah. Yeah. beyond just him eating the food and having some kind of personal fellowship with God. There was a greater truth that was going on. Yeah. A greater light, could we say? A greater light, yeah. yeah. Amen. A greater light. And, of course, we know where the shadow comes from, don't we? A shadow comes because a light is shining. Uh -huh. between, yeah. Between there, the there is a reality there. But the, the reality is not going to cast the shadow unless there's a greater light. Amen. Is it? There's got to be a greater light that creates that shadow. We can look out the windows here and see the shadows of the trees and the edge of the building and so forth. The building's not causing the shadow. It's involved in it, but it's not causing it. We know what's causing the shadow. It's the greater light. And there were certain personalities down through the generations who saw that reality. And we're speaking about that reality. That's our focus and emphasis is all of our sermons, this, all of our lessons, this whole weekend, all of our discussion is about that greater light. And then we see the shadow. Then we see a little more. We see the reality that makes the shape of the shadow. But the reality doesn't cause the shadow. It's the light. It's the light. So you see the opponents of the master and his chosen witnesses Some of them were captivated by the shadow. 
And some of them went a little further and they thought some about the reality. There were some rabbis who thought about the reality and talked about it. They went a little further, but not far enough. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, we don't know if they went far enough or not. <laughs> they were attracted to the reality. But at one point, Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Because he had been in the shadow for so long. It was a frightening thing to think about going out in the blinding light. It's a terrifying thing to think about that blinding light. If you've been living in the cool shadow and you've gotten used to kind of a haze and kind of a mist and, yeah. and, and not seeing too clearly, but, but boy, this is all I've got. And then all at once the light comes on. And you're blinded. Now our brother Paul knew what that was like, didn't he? Yeah. And it, it was a wrenching experience. It had to have been a wrenching experience for him riding along there. And all at once a light came on in broad daylight at high noon. Mm. A greater light greater. appeared and threw him to the ground. And that light spoke. Shattering, his whole world came down. Everything he had been, his family, their status, his place, his whole career ripped away. In a moment of time, it appeared in a moment of time, but of course the reality was, and the light said it, it is hard for you to kick against the goad. He had a sense that was something, something big was happening here. Yeah. And he was not the source. He was not the power behind it. He had a sense of that, but 1,500 years? How could the fathers be wrong? How could it be? He thought about it and thought about it again and again, see? And then the light came on, and he couldn't deny. Couldn't deny. There were others there. But they didn't have a clue. The light was too much for them. They heard the voice but couldn't understand the words. But Paul did. See, it was granted to him to understand the words. Amen. Brother? There's a sense in which those scales that, that Paul were given to protecting against the harmfulness of the light. Yes. We found later that they were a hindrance in natural life. Yes, yeah. Here. They come off later. Yeah, they did. So it wouldn't kill him. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like a laser, you know. <laughs> Sister. I was thinking about this. This is where faith comes in because uh, as you were saying, I was thinking about people who maybe are caught up in a uh, religion where there's some things that are wrong and they believe they were right. So that's what makes it so hard whenever they see yes. something, someone says something, they've got to really have faith to be able to break out of that. Yes. yes. Because yeah. they can say, yeah. How could I have been wrong? Yeah. I, I believe. How could I be so wrong? So the only thing that's going to make you do that is faith through Christ. Amen. To be able to break out. Amen. And and all of us, to one degree, to to one degree or another, except for the young people here who haven't been exposed too much uh, to what uh, all of us had that some have had that somewhat, and we had to come out. At Pentecost, you had the same thing. The yes. They were liberated from a lifetime of yeah. yeah. They came to the point where they said, Man, I'm brother, what shall we do? They knew they could not continue on like they were. Not after hearing these things right. and seeing these things. They knew they not had, after this conviction. They had to adapt to what Peter said. They couldn't adapt what Peter said to what they yeah. had. Yeah. So that decision, yeah. you 
That's yeah. a genuine conversion. Yeah. That's how it happens. Yeah. See, what Peter spoke about had nothing to do with holy days and feasts. Mm. Had nothing to do with the priesthood and the temple and the sacrifices. Had nothing to do with those things. It supersedes. It didn't deny them. He didn't mention them at all. It, it just simply went past them. That's right. And talked about, we know now, because of this greater, because of this exposition and others, talked about their fullness in heavenly places, in the tabernacle made without hands, and the blood of the sacrifice that's like us. We're not like a lamb. We're not like a bullock. We're not like a pigeon or a dove. We're not like ground wheat or olive oil poured out before the Lord. We're not like any of that. Those are of the earth, earthy, more than we are in a sense, because we have a part of us that's not of the earth. Even the unregenerate do. This last week, I had a young man working for me, and, and he was, he's, he's a, a little above the cut and didn't say very much. He didn't come to our scripture time. But he had to listen to five books of the Bible, seven books of the Bible this week while he was working. <laughs> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and, and uh, the other two, uh, uh, Mark and... I can't remember the other one now. And so uh, he was exposed to these things, and I was able to ensnare him Friday morning for a few minutes in a discussion about righteousness and revelation from God. Well, I believe in God. Um, and he said it himself. I just don't think that there's uh, only one way and so forth. Well, my goodness, that's an opening wide enough you could drive a trailer truck through it. So I did, and we had quite a discussion. Uh, and I was able to elaborate on it again and again and again and take the scripture and say, yeah, the, and he'd say something. I'd say, well, yeah, the scripture speaks about that. And he'd say something. I'd say, well, yeah, the scripture speaks about that. I said, you've just got to come down to the point where you have to face whether or not you believe what God says. Well, I believe the truth is in there, but it's been, it's been uh, uh, written down by men, you know, men who could change it and so forth. I said, you think God's just going to turn his revelation over to men and let them do with it whatever they want? Then he's not God, is he? Well, I didn't get an answer to that. Not verbal, anyway. And so these are the kinds of things, you see, that we can say to those who claim to believe but don't really believe. They acknowledge. They acknowledge, which everything does. The trees out here acknowledge. The birds acknowledge their maker. The sun and the rain acknowledges its maker. Peace be still! And it obeys. See? He'd turn the sun back if he wants. Or he can extend it if he wants, can he? In the day of Joshua, in the day of Hezekiah, he can do it either way. It's a small matter to him. Because these are earthly things. What we're talking about here are not earthly things. They are high and holy things. Things not like us, Sister Jim. This, this matter of faith still remains a mystery to people, although it is said very plainly. Uh, I was thinking of this example. You were talking about the Word of God and just believing the Word of God. There was a, a time back whenever there was some... Uh, astrophysicists that worked with NASA found the missing minutes uh, in, in Some hours. kind of crack in time, yeah. Yeah. But you know, I never heard anybody that was involved in that dialogue or, or heard about that, I never heard anybody ask or say, well, you know, men's mathematics can be kind of faulty. One man's mathematics is in another man's mathematics. And how do we know that this man really understood math that much? And I yes. never heard that. Yes. But you'll hear people question the word of God. They do. They question the word of God like that. And yeah. something a lot more simple yeah. than astrophysics and its math. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
Did I see another hand out of the corner of my eye here? Very good, okay. We're going to continue on then here and talking about the shadow. Shadow of the good things to come. Aren't these words genius? How much truth is compressed into just these few words? Having a shadow of the good things to come. That's greater light. The good things to come. And of course the law and the prophets testified of these good things to come. There, there's a record there if you're, if you're willing to see it. Remember that text that, that uh, Sister Debbie read from Jeremiah? Here, let me get it. I don't have it in my notes, and so I snatched her notes here. Add to you, this is Jeremiah 7, 21. Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I, hear, and listen to these incisive words from 600 years before John the Baptist. And of course, Jeremiah is the one who says, I'll make a new covenant. <clears throat> not like the one. I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifice. But he did. So Jeremiah must be contradicting Moses, isn't he? Now you got another contradiction in the scriptures. No, Moses knew. Didn't he? Moses knew that burnt offerings was not the point. Now, at that time, it was the point for those children. But Moses had already gone way beyond that. He'd already gone way beyond it. And he spoke to them many times about their hearts, didn't he? He told them why he gave those commandments and all that. It wasn't so that they Yeah, so, and so that they would fear. That's right, so the purpose of the commandments was never spelled out to, to make you accept Yeah, yeah. Now the prophets down through the generations expounded these things mm -hmm. and made application of them and, and brought them back again and again and again to the commandments, to the sacrifices, to the priesthood, to the temple. Again and again and again. What was uh, uh, Haggai and Zechariah provoking the people about rebuilding the temple? See, and it's isn't it Haggai that says hey, you're you're spending your resources for yourselves. It's like putting money in a bag with a hole in the bottom. That's right. You bring everything. And build my house. And then I'll take care of why, my goodness, that sounds like seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness Amen. and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. Yeah. As he's going to say in this text you've got, it, if those sacrifices had just gone through the routine of satisfy God, then they would have yeah. he wouldn't ask for them. They would have done the job the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wouldn't have had to keep repeating. And, that, and, of course, that's the argument of the writer, yeah. of the Holy Spirit through this writer here, through the Apostle Paul, I think. That's a strong argument against routine. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work the first time. And it comes all the way from Sinai, huh? That's right. <laughs> if it doesn't work the first time, yeah. then you're just beating your head against the wall. Yeah. But first time you believe, it works. Yeah. And yet, when you make some progress, you can see that if you turn what works into a routine, That's right. then it loses its power, That's right. doesn't it? Amen. Amen. So, Which is man's yes, the flesh will do that, see? Those who have no heart, real heart for God, will do such a thing. They'll turn what is right and good into an instrument for their own desires instead of a, a revelation from God that pleases him and brings us to him where we then have fellowship with God. Now, God received those, the, the 12 pillars that were set up at the mountain, the 12 young men offering the sacrifices. Now, this was before the law was given, wasn't it? This, this was their approach to God, and he accepted that. 
even though it had not been specifically revealed. Of course, he accepted Abel's sacrifice, didn't he? See, if they'd gone back into their own history, of course, maybe they didn't have that. At that it's likely they didn't have it then. If they'd gone back into their oral history. They could have remembered that God received Abel's sacrifice without high priest, without feast day, without the crown, without the breastplate. He accepted that. Why? <laughs> because a heart of faith offered it. That's why. Sister Jude. The, the heart of faith is what has made that acceptable whenever the revelation uh, is given about something more specific. But the mind and heart of man is not large enough uh, or high enough to discern what should be a right approach to God. Yes. And that's why God gave them the law and the priests who were the custodians of that truth and continued to talk to people so that every man wasn't going out in his field and then just making up mm -hmm. his own approach to God. Yeah. Uh, because God, righteousness is at the heart of this. Yes. God, in, in righteousness, can discern what is acceptable to him, but then his righteousness also instructs about that acceptableness. Mm -hmm. And in Jesus, we have the epitome of that. Yes. And anything that a person teaches that does not bring a person to the righteousness that is defined by God in his word, mm -hmm. that, that right there, that puts the lie to whatever they're saying. I'm looking at several very, uh, as I say this, I'm referencing in my mind, uh, several very prominent cults. And they profess to have a righteousness. But when you compare that to the righteousness of Scripture and what God calls righteous, and, and His own character as He reveals it in His Word, see, it, there's not harmony in it. It's a different path. They're trying to say... Yes, yes, we're righteous. We do some of those things too, but. Mm -hmm. well, on, Brother. This, on this matter of these sacrifices, I burn like Abel. Remember Noah after the after yes. the ark. Yes. The land is saved, and God said, "Go forth out of the ark, thou and thy wife and sons. Bring with thee every living thing that is with thee." And they may breathe quietly on the earth, so he did. But the first thing he does, he builds an altar, and he offers from the, of every clean beast to the Lord. And apparently, this was he was not told to do this, but it was God spelled it and satisfied and received it. So deep, there was like a, a sense evidently in this. Yes. In men like Abel and Noah. Mm -hmm. like Their faith gave them that That's sense, right. just like. Abraham's faith gave him the sense that God would raise Isaac from the dead, yes, right. though it was not revealed. No such thing had been made known. Yeah, and it's just every clean beast. Yes. There yep. was a sense of what was acceptable. Some things were acceptable, some things were not, acceptable. yes. Yeah. And of course, Cain was not interested in what was acceptable. I gave it to you. Why isn't that good enough? That's his reasoning. Yeah. It was of my hands. It was a gift to you. But God himself is the standard, see. This righteousness of God that's revealed in the Law and the Prophets, it's the righteousness of God and it's apart from the Law and the Prophets. It's bigger than that. It, there was a little bit of it there. There was some of it there. But not its fullness. No, it didn't say, I love you, we start the earth all over again. We can't, we to have every animal. We can't give any. Look at the circumstances that you got here. He yes. The only animals in the entire world are the ones that are on that ark. Yeah. But he took of every claim that he offers to God. See, God took the precedence over the situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. And he still does. Our God takes precedence over our own circumstances, even religious circumstances. He takes precedence. See? Those of faith are not interested in what sounds good to me. 
what's comfortable to me, what looks good to me, that's not the point. Is it acceptable to God? And he has told us, oh man, what he desires. Now that, see, that's a continuation of that text from the prophet Micah. Mr. Debbie read just the first couple of thoughts, and it, it goes on and speaks more about what God approves and accepts, what he looks for, and it, it's the fruit that he looks for in his people, see? Like the landowner came to inspect the vineyard and see what kind of grapes he had. But he found that he had, instead of good grapes, sour grapes. Well, it must have been the one who planted it. It's his fault, isn't it? Many would think that. Yeah, you should have, should have invested a little more in your plantings. And you'd have had good grapes. Well, in this case, the one who planted had invested himself. Hadn't he? What more could I have done? There you go. Okay, the law, having a shadow of the good things to come. Shadow. You remember the writer there in Psalm 119 uses these terms precepts and testimonies, statutes, judgments, ordinances, laws, commands, words, truth, way. There are probably a couple other synonyms in there about the revelation of God. And through that whole song, not one word is said about tabernacle, priesthood, or sacrifice. Not one word is said about the, the revealed tenets of the law of Moses given to Israel at Sinai. Not one word. And yet the whole thing is about God's revelation. Because you see, this writer had already surpassed those things. They likely kept them. But he knew that they were not an end of themselves. They were a means to a greater end. Amen. May God not satisfied with just fulfilling duty. Yes. That's right. When Paul went to, finally arrived in Rome, he gathered the Jewish leaders with, to, him, to his house there, and he spoke to them all day long, explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. He said, when he stood there before Herod Agrippa II, I speak nothing but what Moses and the prophets have said would come to pass. And nobody said, nah, you don't know what you're talking. Nobody said that. Or none of the Jews did, I should say. None of the Jews did. Uh, Festus did say, your great learning is driving you mad because these things were so high and so large for him, he couldn't get, he couldn't get his mind around it. His educated, elite government trained mind it must be crazy you must be out of it <laughs> well he was Paul was out of the world the things he talked about were not of this world and so those who live here and abide here and have their hope here you people are crazy we shouldn't be surprised at all shouldn't be surprised at all and when you try to when you when you try to come back to earth when you, when you come back to earth and start talking about earthly things so that you'll fit so that you will be comfortable so that you will be accepted then it is not the gospel then you don't have any good news you really don't the, hey, the, uh, the doctors and the lawyers and the politician they're all saying the same thing sorry they're saying the same kinds of things and they may be better at it than you Likely they are, because the sons of this age are wiser, aren't they? So if you try to fit God's truth into a comfortable container, a familiar container, then you will have contained his truth, and it's not containable. 
in anything of this earth. God was pleased for his fullness to dwell in one person, not even a place, not a thing, but a person. Yeah, he's the only one that contain Yes. And he was the true light, mm -hmm. which coming into the world enlightens every man. He's Amen. willing to make you a son of the light if you believe. Mm. He'll put that light in you. And then there will be no shadow. Here's the contain. He's full of grace and truth, but he pours it out. Yes. Without losing any of it, he pours it out into the city. Yeah. Now, that, now Moses couldn't do that. Yeah. He couldn't take what he had and pour it out. No. God had to do that. That's right. He, and he did it in one case. He took a little bit of the spirit that was on him and he put it on some others. And it was just a little bit. Moses had a pretty big container, didn't he? <laughs> Perhaps larger than any of us. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. He was the one that heaven sent to appear with the master on the mountain, wasn't he? Him and Elijah. Yeah. They were the one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the, and the revelation of God's person through them. And, they both talked and there they stood. Something, something that neither one of them talked about on the earth. <laughs> yeah, a shadow, a shadow of the good things to come, not the very image of the things. And not the very form, profile, or the resemblance. Remember that uh, Brother Aaron used the words yesterday of, of the shadow being only two-dimensional. Width and height. No depth. Yeah. There's no depth to you. Yeah. You can go out there and put your foot right in the shadow. You know? And there's no depth to it. That's, that's right. But you remember that the Apostle Paul prayed for the believers there in Ephesus mm -hmm. that they would know the height, length, width, and depth. The length and the depth. Yeah. See, now that's four-dimensional. Four instead of two dimensional, it's four dimensional. That's that's the very image. See, yeah, the very image. And there's a sense in which what he wanted them to know was just just this expression of God, not God Himself, because He is the light. He is this light in Him. There is no darkness. He is the light. What we have revealed here, even in its brightness of the day star, which is, which is dawned from on high, even in that brightness, we, we only have, presently only have the earthly reality, or the heavenly reality. We have both, <laughs> but, and, and, and it is some of the light. But here we won't get the fullness of the light. We'll have to go there to that city where there is no lamp and there is no temple because he himself fulfills both and is both. He himself. We shall see his face and his name shall be upon us. See? Not the shadow. Uh, we've, we've, we've surpassed the shadow now. We're, yes. we're still talking about it because it tells us some things, important things that we need to know and remember. Learn about this image, substance. This image is the substance and evidence, which is our faith. Our faith. See, the things that are revealed give us this faith. And our faith is that substance and image. The things that are made known about the Savior and his work. These invisible things. These things unseen. We look at what is invisible. Mm -hmm. And yet it's substance. <laughs> not substance as we know it here. Not, not measurable by a ruler. Or a scale. It's as real as your soul or your heart. Yeah. Your spirit is. Neither of which yeah. material. Yeah. And even the ungodly and unbelieving recognize 
and talk about the human soul, don't they? Some of them talk about the human spirit and the heart, the inner man. Some of them do talk about that, don't they? Through the expressions of literature and music, especially. Through the things that we make, you know, architects making buildings, so forth, they talk about a heart or a soul and the spiritual implications of architecture or, or even, uh, even the, the earth itself, the forest and the trees, the plains, or the vast empty desert, or the great high mountains and the, and, and the expansive seas. They talk about the earth that way, you know, as they bow in worship to it. When in all of these things, we see God's own nature only by faith. See, that makes it the substance. Amen. The substance is already there, I, I should say. I want to remind you, our faith, some people think that our faith makes it into something. And, and the ungodly and unbelieving will tell you, oh, yeah, your faith makes it into that. You make, the, you make this up by your faith, see. But no, the faith comes in those things. In this revelation, the faith comes in it. And there, there was some, some of that in creation, not very much. Nothing you could really think on or make much progress toward God by what was seen there. But you could see there was something there. There's something there. Those who worship the earth just want to say, it's the earth. It's the, the earth is alive. Oh, wonderful earth. The seas and the winds, the sun and the seasons, it's alive. <laughs> it's alive only because of the spirit of him who made it. And he is spirit. And, yeah, yeah. Yes. So these things then, the law having a shadow, it was not made known before because it wasn't the time yet. The fullness of time had not yet come. But it was coming. A day is coming when I will make a new house. I'm sorry, a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. It will be a new house too. Brother Jeremy will talk about that tonight. A new covenant. A day was coming. A day was coming. Jeremiah is also the one who said, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, a, a time will come or a day will come when the Ark of the Covenant, this Ark, would not come to mind. Of course, they were losing it. They were in the process of losing it in Jeremiah's generation. It would not be seen again. God removed it. Likely, he took it to himself. Yeah, it was like the brazen serpent. It would become a competitor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point there. Eventually, all competitive influences are removed. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. Yeah. And they, uh, uh, well, even in the days of Samuel, it was close to that. When they thought, now we'll beat the Philistines. We've got the Ark of the Covenant here. Yeah, that's right. it's you know, it's the old God in a box thing. We'll take him out. We'll get you now. Sure, they could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, our forefathers carried it around Jericho and the walls fell down. Yeah. You people have had it. And the next day, the Philistines carried it away. Of course, God took care of his covenant. Nobody touched it. They didn't dare. What do you suppose some of those, some of those slaves of the Philistines thought or whoever it was that said, take that ark of the God of Israel and put it on a cart. Who was going to touch that thing? <laughs> they already had a plague in the city. Who was going to touch the thing? Apparently somebody did. I get the picture that someday in the history of the world, God's going to work in such a manner people are going to be able to be afraid to touch anything that comes from God or blaspheme like a lot of people do. And mm -hmm. if God is going to come, I'm going to be afraid to do it. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some people that work for me react that way to things about the Scripture. Yes. I've seen it in their faces when they hear us talk about it. 
And they asked me about something about the scripture, and I and I make the connections for them and so forth. There's a a far away look, and I, I'm not sure if they're really thinking about it or if they're thinking, I've got to get away from this place. Some of them did that, you know. Some of them wouldn't come back. So it, 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 there, 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 is a, there is a sense of fear. There is a sense of fear. And you can see it once in a while. After they died, great fear came upon the church. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And of the rest, no one dared join themselves to it. Yeah, who's going to touch that thing? We're not going to touch those people. Say, who wants to be a part of that where you die if you do something out of line? So, the very image, the very image, the good word of God and the Holy Spirit, the powers of the age to come. See, this, this, this is this reality that, makes, that made the shadow. And this is what God grants to us who are believers then. We begin to partake of these things and they become part of us. We eat them. We eat these things. They become part of our life. We walk in them move around in them. We have our being in them. In these things. Yeah, we have a table. Yeah. But they are not an end of themselves, see? They're a means to an end. Amen. They are a substance here in the earth. They are a reality here in the earth. But there's a greater reality. Yeah. We're, we're moving toward that reality. Amen. Willingly and gladly walking the straight and the narrow way. These sacrifices, they can never make perfect those who approach. Can never make those who approach perfect, I should say. The same ones year after year after year. Leviticus 7, 37. This is the law of the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the consecrations, and the sacrifice of the peace offering. It's not totally complete there. There's also drink offerings. These things were made daily. They were personal offerings made by those who had a tender heart seeking to approach God. These things grew larger and larger. Let me remind you, this has already been mentioned, but I want to remind you again. In the day that David gave Solomon the plans for the temple, 1 Chronicles 29, David said to all the people, the assembly, now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord God of their fathers, bowed their heads, prostrated themselves before the Lord and the king. They made sacrifice to the Lord. Pardon me. They made sacrifices to the Lord, offered burnt offerings, to the Lord on the next day, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs with their drink offerings, sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. Now that was the day when the plans for the temple that God had given to David were transferred to his son who would build the temple. Then, of course, at the completion of the temple... We have two accountings of it here. 2 Chronicles 5 and 1 Kings 8. Solomon and all the congregation of Israel were assembled with him before the ark. Were sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. The other writer says, I get the impression that he just rounded it off. Solomon offered to sacrifice the peace offerings which he offered to the Lord. 22,000 bulls. 22,000. Three zeros. 22,000 bulls. 120,000 sheep. In round numbers. The, the writer of Chronicles said they couldn't be counted or numbered. But someone attempted to estimate. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. Offered year continually, year by year. These continue. Those were just one event. That was just one event in the in the days of uh, 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 Josiah. Was it Josiah when they when they reestablished the Passover again? There were likely large and, and and the revival in the days of Hezekiah. 
And Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, Josiah, they all had revivals during their time. And there were likely multitudes of sacrifices made. Multitude. Josiah's day, of course, was when Jeremiah's ministry started. Ezekiel likely served in the temple during that time. Maybe, maybe not till afterwards. Maybe not till Josiah's son, then Josiah's nephew, Zedekiah. Their faithfulness is commendable, which is the point of our main text. Our, our writer here in Hebrews 10 does not criticize the offerers of the sacrifices. He, he has no critical commentary on either their manner or their heart. He simply states the fact. His point is to state the fact, the reality of God's revelation concerning these things being incomplete. It was a shadow. And now we have the reality. He's telling his readers, you have not left the intent of God's command. His purpose in the law. You've not left it at all. You have fulfilled it. Now again, Jeremiah spoke of these things when the Lord said through him, I did not speak to your fathers about burnt offerings. So see, Jeremiah knew that. There were other, David knew that as well, didn't he? When he said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Fellowship. He knew these things constituted fellowship with the Most High. Bulls and lambs and goats, those don't <coughs> constitute fellowship. They're, they're a small step. There's a sense in which any ungodly person can do that. That is, go through the motions of making those kinds of animal sacrifices. And they did, didn't they? Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. See, that's the fullness of fellowship with God. And he has to do it. David knew that. I don't offer to you bulls. They don't please you. Now you remember where these words came from. They came as David was recovering from a great fall. And he knew it. And he knew what the Most High demanded. All of these animals... Yeah, we're just about to run out of time. All these animals, not one bull, not one lamb was conscious of transgression, was it? No. Not one was aware. They did not participate with the one who was offering. And the offerer did not participate with them except to take their life or to bring them that their life might be taken by the priest. And the priest didn't participate with them either. There was no sympathy there was no fellowship with them in the animals, nor the animals with them, except that they offered it, and then they ate it. There was no willingness on the part of that lamb or bull. No involvement ahead of time. That's why this writer says, the blood of bulls and goats it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Amen. See, there's no personal connection there. Mm -hmm. No life, no real life. There's an existence in the same environment. But if they'd let those animals go, they would have run. You know, an animal senses danger, doesn't it? Yeah. Those animals were not laying down on that altar and stretching out their necks right here. They were not doing that. But brethren, we know that the Lamb of God did, didn't he? Amen. Amen. Fully knowing. Refusing anything that interfered with his fellowship. 
with the suffering. Remember where there in Philippians 3, the Apostle Paul talked about the fellowship of suffering? We have that place. Each of us has a place of fellowship in his sufferings. There remains yet suffering for the church. Adam and Eve's innocence did not protect them, did it? And the innocence of the animals do not secure or obtain anything for the offer. Not really. Except that it was a reminder to God that he was going to provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Sister. No. Except for Christ, so there would be no way a man could have been offered before Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. So this reminder then was a, this, this continuous reminder was like a precursor of conviction concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Mm -hmm. Which came only, in full came only as the Holy Spirit was given. Amen. Only God could do that. Amen. So just earlier in this letter, chapter 9, verses 9 through 14, the writer says, Gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performs the service perfect in regard to the conscience. That is the awareness. See? The one offered must be aware and the one offering must also be aware. In this case, though, with the Lamb of God, he was the only one who was aware. Yeah. But it's enough that the proclamation of that reality also makes us aware by the power of his spirit. That convicts us concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment, and then keeps us aware, keeps us sensitive these things that we do by gathering and speaking about these things and then meeting, of course, at this table keeps us aware. Constantly aware that the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanses your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Brethren, this offering, offered through the blood of the everlasting covenant, has brought us then to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit Amen. to bring us to God. Amen. Thank you, brethren, for your involvement and participation this morning. Does anyone have any other comments about these things? This is a vast, we've just barely scratched the surface, vast uh, truth for us to probe into and be reminded of again and again. Any others comments in? It is. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Let's stand together then, brethren, and we'll pray and, and uh, dismiss and have a short time of refreshment, speak together more about these things, and, and then gather again.